Welcome, welcome everyone. Here we are, continuing our discussion on risk and return. Specifically, now we're gonna be calculating some expected returns and variances. Keyword is expected, so we're gonna look into the future. Uh, then we're going to discuss the trade-off between risk and return. And finally, we will introduce the concept of diversification and figure out the difference between systematic and unsystematic risk. So, again, returns in the uncertain world. Well, this is what we're looking at in the future. Okay, so now we're looking at future events or before the event. And in order to do that, we need to start considering probabilities. Okay, so what is our expectation of the return? And what is the probability of that return? Also, the risk or the certainty of this uh, return. So what does that look like in terms of our formulas? Well, if we consider the expected payoff, we actually have to consider each individual payoff times its probability, and then we will add them all together, which will be the sum of our, um, <clears throat> that will give us our expected payoff. Once we have that, then we can ultimately figure out our standard deviation. Again, we're gonna compare that expected payoff to each individual payoff and that each individual payoff during that state. If you don't know what I'm talking about, let's continue. Now we'll look at an example and hopefully that will help us. Um, before we get into the example, just a reminder, when we're dealing with probabilities, we need to make sure the probabilities add up to 100%, right? So we're trying to account for all um, opportunities or all outcomes. And obviously these probabilities must be positive. <clears throat> so there's something to remember. So let's look at an example. In this case, we have a stock XYZ and we're gonna calculate the expected return and the standard deviation. Here is our information, here are our conditions, okay? So again, referring back to that individual probability or payoff, we, we're gonna figure out the individual um, expected return of each state, and then we're gonna add them all together, and that's gonna help us figure out the expected return. So we're gonna use this as a reference, but before we get into it, let's think about what this is actually uh, meaning. So in this case, if we have our stock XYZ, um, during a recession when the economy is not doing very well, um, we have a negative return on our stock. So poor performance of our stock during a recession. And the likelihood of that recession, there's about a 45% chance of that happening. Okay? Uh, when we get into the steady economy, <clears throat> the, the probability is a little bit lower, 35%. But the good news is that our return of that stock is much healthier. We have a positive 12% return. And finally, in a booming economy or a very, uh, you know, very uh, aggressive and positive economy, things are doing well. This is not always as likely. It looks like a 20% probability. But in that case, the stock, the XYZ stock return is 20%. So what we want to figure out, <clears throat> again, taking into consideration the expectation and the, and the uh, riskiness or the probability, we want to figure out what is the expected return and really what is the certainty of that return by calculating the standard deviation. So let's use it as a reference there. We'll have it there and let's apply our formula. So again, we wanna look at each individual uh, economic state, the probability of the state, <clears throat> and also the return in that economic state. Then we get the sum of them all, we add them all together. So we start with the recession. There's a 45% chance that there will be a recession and in that case, we have that negative 10% return um, for this stock. We look at the, we add the steady economy to the equation. We have a 35% uh, probability with a 12% expected return. And then finally, if there's a boom economy, it looks like we have a 20% chance of that happening with a 20% expected return. Then we simply added them up and that gives us our expected <clears throat> return uh, for this stock. Now, with that said, we can now calculate the standard deviation. Because remember, what we're gonna ultimately do is compare this expected return to the individual uh, returns of each state and then the probability of that state. And that will give us, ultimately what it's gonna give us is the, the variance or the standard deviation. And that's gonna help us, if you recall, the greater the standard deviation, the greater the risk. So when we do the math, uh, again, where do we get this negative 10%? Well, we're simply referring to the, during the recession, we have a negative 
So compared to the 3.72, uh, we take the difference and square it. And of course, we take the probability of that happening, which is the 45%. And then we just do the same for the other two states or the other two um, econ types of economies. And we get our variance when we add them all up. The sum of the variance, square root of the sum of the variance gives us our standard deviation. So now we can see um, the standard deviation. So we've calculated the, uh, the expected uh, payoff and the standard deviation or the uncertainty of this stock. So speaking of uncertainty, uh, let's talk about the risk and return trade-off. So remember, when we analyze an investment, we need to think about the return potential and the riskiness or variability of that uh, investment. And as we've looked at in the previous video, we've, we've recognized, particularly when we're comparing, uh, well, I would say treasury bills and small company stocks, we recognize that higher returns, such as um, investing in small companies, uh, do are great because they have the highest average return, but they also have the higher risk associated with them as well. So something to think about, and what we're going to do is can come up with two rules that will help us become more rational uh, decision makers. And ultimately, we're going to address this trade-off when we come up to a uh, decision we have to make. So let's start with some rules. We have two rules here. First is if we have two choices in terms of investments, and they both have the same expected returns, then we're going to select the one with the lower expected risk. Makes sense? Second rule is if we have two choices and they have the same level of risk associated, then we're going to select the one with the higher expected return. Okay? So really, we start to recognize that obviously our, our goal as investors is to maximize our return and minimize our risk. Okay? Uh, and that's what we want to do, which is ideal, right? However, if again we think about our examples so far, we realize that when we are looking at higher um, investment or higher invest investments that have higher expected returns, they also have higher uh, variances or higher risk associated. So this is the challenge that we have. So it's not really uh, realistic that we can expect to have the highest returns and also the lowest risk. So what is the solution? Well, we'll talk about this in a moment, but really diversification is, is really the most common uh, strategy uh, to minimize risk, and we'll, we'll discuss this in a moment. But let's get back to some examples and see if we can apply our investment rules. And ultimately, what we want to do is we're looking at two investments here, A and B. Which investment should we make? Which one should we choose or select? Well, again, if we consider investment rule number one, which re references two investments that have similar expected returns or the same expected returns, which would be in this case here, we can see the expected returns are, are both similar on the y-axis here. <clears throat> what is different is the level of risk. So it looks like A is less riskier than B, okay? So in this case, we would select A. So that's great. That seems very straightforward. Let's look at another example, okay? So in this case, we have an investment D and C, which investment decision should we make? Well, let's consider investment rule number two, which states that if we have similar risk profiles with two investments, we would select the one with the higher expected return. So uh, I guess you're catching on. It's always the one with the arrow to it. But in this case, again, we would select investment C because even though they both have the same risk associated with the investment, the expected return is much higher for C. So that makes sense. Again, we're using these to make rational investment decisions. Let's see what happens in this uh, choice. So in this case, we have L and S, and we could fair to assume that L stands for large company stocks and S counts for small company stocks, okay? So in this case, is it as clear cut? Well, I don't know. I don't think it is. And that's probably because of that trade-off that we discussed. So if we look at the large company stock and we just look at risk, we would see that the large company stock is a much more attractive uh, choice because there's much less risk compared to the small company stock. However, what's the trade-off with having less risk? Well, it's a less expected return. So uh, the reward is not as high compared to the small uh, company stock. So there's our trade-off 
that we start to understand and we realize <clears throat> and really it comes down to sometimes a tolerance for risk are you prepared to take on that risk uh, that's something you have to consider as an investor okay now we discussed diversification how it can help minimize risk well we we introduced that idea let's discuss it a little bit more now so what do we mean by diversification well ultimately what we mean is that we're not investing in one um, investment we're we're spreading our eggs not in one basket okay and the idea of doing that is that we're going to somehow limit risk and ideally what we're trying to do is we're investing in uh, low correlated uh, assets we'll talk about that in just one moment and the idea is if you know if one stock or one asset does poorly the other stock will do uh, well and it was really the idea is to sort of balance out any exposure to risk so let's take a look at an example here and what we're going to see first is a table uh, very similar to what we just saw but the difference is now we have two companies okay so we have company the return of company zig okay so this is the expected returns of company zig in certain states and the return of company zag in um, in same uh, idea with the states here now in this case in a way we've actually chosen instead of to invest in one stock we're now choosing to invest in two stocks and what thing one thing you'll notice <clears throat> is uh, think about the correlation between these two stocks if you look at for instance in the boom state it looks like when the uh, when company zig in a boom economy does very well company zag doesn't do very well and vice versa if you look at during the recession uh, company zig does actually doesn't do very well whereas company zag does quite well so it looks like there's a good balance here and we can see it's fair to make that assumption or even that uh, conclusion that they are negatively correlated because they they seem to have opposite uh, returns based off of um, the different types of economies okay now one thing this table has already uh, calculated is expected return and they've done it in both looking at through each company figuring out the expected return or they've also looked at it in terms of each state and figuring out the expected return now it seems like 15 percent is a quite uh, popular number in this chart so let's go ahead though and figure out how they calculated that expected return so we can do it in two ways and we've already looked at one uh, similar to the first XYZ, but we'll go ahead and uh, do some review here. So we can figure out our expected return now of the entire portfolio by looking at the expected return of Zig, um, figuring out how much we're investing in Zig. Okay, now uh, one thing perhaps I forgot to mention is that this is a 50 50 portfolio. So, in other words, we are investing evenly in both companies. Okay, so think about that in terms of the weights. But we'll get to that in a moment okay and after we figure out the expected return of zig we're also going to figure out the expected return of zag and once we do that we can assign the weights of both investments and that's how we can calculate the expected return so this is one way of doing it and this is really focusing on each different stock other way to do it or method is looking at each specific condition okay so we can figure out the expected return based off of each individual probability of the economic state times that portfolio return in that economic state. Okay, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a moment. But let's get back to number one. So we'll start with looking at each individual stock. Okay, so again, this is our formula. And I basically just highlighted what we're going to be for, uh, calculating right here. Uh, and I've also just included the information that we need. So basically what we need to know is the return <clears throat> of uh, Zig Company. That's the information we need here. And we need the probability um, of each state. Okay, so in other words, how often <clears throat> are we going to get a return of 25% for um, company Zig? Well, about 20% and, and, and so forth. So we basically take these and we add that up and we basically get a weighted average of the return of company zig okay now we're gonna do the same thing for zag okay so again in this case so i've added i've included the 15 percent what we just calculated but now we want to figure out the expected return of zag so we take the same idea we're now we're just looking at the return on zag company so that's what i've taken from that table we still have the same probabilities 
Um, but the difference is now, as you can see, the, that the, the returns are different, okay? So once we do that, again, we add them together, <clears throat> and it looks like this is why we can also start to see that when one company does well, the other one does poorly, but it looks like there's a pretty good balance because, again, we have a 15% return on company Zag, okay? So it looks like no matter what, we're going to get a 15% return, but let's do the math. So once we have these two uh, 15%, next thing we need to figure out is what is the weight of each investment? Well, remember, uh, the weight of each investment is 50-50 because the portfolio is a 50-50 or evenly invested uh, portfolio, and there's only two stocks, so that's why we get 50-50. So that's why I've uh, put it nice evenly uh, weighted here. So again, this is the weight of Zig, and this is the weight of Zag. We've already calculated the 15% of each, and what the ends up is, well, not surprisingly, we get another 15%, okay? So this is a very, um, it's a very simple example in, in regards to um, how um, mathematically um, balanced these investments are, but it's not likely that that's going to happen all the time. Okay. Now we've looked at the expected return, but we still haven't figured out what is the risk associated with this return. Okay, and this is what we need to start looking at, calculating the standard deviation. But with these numbers, let's see what happens because, <clears throat> well, let's see what happens with the, the um, variance. Okay, but before we do that, um, we're going to look at the other method. Okay, so that was the, the method in calculating each stock's return and then figuring out the uh, return based off of the weights. Now we're going to look at it based off of the um, conditions. Okay, so remember there's three conditions we had to consider. Okay. And once we figure out each condition, then we can figure out the portfolio's expected return. <clears throat> so how do we do it this way? Well, really don't worry about, instead of looking at down vertically, now we're looking horizontally, really look at it that way. So now we're actually taking into consideration both companies and the focus now is the boom. Okay, so we're gonna look at the portfolio return of the boom economy. Okay, so we take the 25% and the 5%, 25 from Zig and 5% from Zag. We know that it's a 50-50, so the weight of each of these companies is 50%, and we get a 15% expected return in the boom economy, okay? And really, we're doing the exact same thing for the steady economy. We're really just looking at it horizontally now, so we're, we're ultimately identifying the, um, <clears throat> the 17%, and the 13%, okay? And again, the weight is gonna be even at 50% because we're investing evenly in both stocks and we get our 15%. And finally, we have 5% and the 25% based off of uh, zig and zag, and now we have the 15%. And the only thing we have to figure out now are the probabilities. We haven't, we haven't looked at the probability yet, right? We just know that <clears throat> in the, in, during a recession, our portfolio is gonna have a 15% um, return, but we don't know how, how often that's going to be. So we have to account for the probability. So we simply uh, take our probabilities and here we are. So we remember we have that 15% <clears throat> expected return in the boom economy. Now, what is the likelihood of the boom economy? Well, there's a 20% chance of that. We have that and we take the sum of our next uh, state, which is the steady economy at 15% at 50%, okay, so there's a likely half, li half likelihood that it will occur as a steady economy, again, a 15%, and then finally a recession, 30% chance of a recession times the 15%. And finally, we get our expected return of 15%. So this is method two of calculating our probability, or calculating our expected return, pardon me, so again, there's just a little bit of a recap here. <clears throat> so in both cases, we've, we've calculated expected return of our portfolio of 15%, whether we went through here, or we could actually go through each economy and then figure out the probability of each economy happening, 15%. So you have some flexibility, it's wonderful. Ultimately, you're just figuring out a weighted average in both cases. So now we know that the 15% is what we can expect. We want also want to know what is the risk associated. Is this a guaranteed 15%? What's the standard deviation? 
So this is where we go to our variance and our standard deviation. And if you recall from our formula, <clears throat> again, we're, now we're looking at the expected return of our portfolio, which we calculated, which was the 15%. And we, but now we have to look at each individual state, okay? And once we do that, <clears throat> we can calculate our standard deviation. The only thing that's kind of interesting in this case is you'll notice that our return in each state was 15%. So the 15 minus the 15 gives us a zero. Uh, so ultimately what happens is that we actually have a standard deviation of zero, which seems a little odd. And it is odd because technically it's undefined. And technically what that's actually saying is that uh, there is no uncertainty, okay? Now, mathematically, uh, that's fair. And actually, if you look again, going back to our uh, investment choices, because we basically um, <clears throat> diversified almost perfectly, and think about what did we do, okay? So one thing we did in order to uh, diversify um, perfectly is that we invested in two different stocks that are not correlated with each other, okay? So in other words, um, Zig and Zag are very much opposite from each other. And ultimately, the higher the negative correlation between the two stocks, the higher the reduction in risk that we can achieve by adding it to the portfolio. So that's what we really ideally want to do, okay? So in this case, this is an example of two companies that perform uh, basically inversely related to each other or negatively correlated. This is an example of what happens when you have two companies that are positively correlated, okay? So, <clears throat> and this is why di diversification um, won't occur if you if you only invest in stocks that have the same correlation well here's the problem so again this is an example of two different companies okay so this is peat co and repeat co okay i guess that makes sense so in terms of peat co you can see what happens okay so we have returns um, up and down basically these are sort of what we can expect from uh, peat co but if you can notice, the, the returns from repeat co are very similar, okay? So this might be very, you know, very similar industries, uh, you know, when things are good, uh, you know, for selling umbrellas. Uh, the two companies that are selling umbre umbrellas, when it's raining, they're both selling umbrellas, but then when it's sunny, they both go down, okay? So the problem with that is that your returns are also very much the same, and you're not really minimizing that risk, Okay, so you, this is the problem is you have that risk. Now, I will say one thing that you will notice, though, is when things go well, you do have a higher expected return. So that's a good thing. But in terms of minimizing risk, this is um, problematic. Now, going back to diversification with our two other companies, we had Zig and Co. See, this is, this is the beauty of diversification. So this is what we mean by per perfectly negative correlation of two assets. So again, remember we had Zig. So when it performed poorly, uh, Zag was performing well. When it performed really well, Zag was performing really poorly. So they're pretty much identically, perfectly negatively correlated. So what does that mean in terms of our portfolio? Well, remember that 15%? Here it is. Basically, that's what's going to happen is that you're going to get, It's sure, you're not going to have any spikes. You're not going to have a, a high return, but you're going to have a very even return. It's a very guaranteed return. Because you know that you know when things go poorly for one company, things are going to go well with the other. So really, they're just balancing things out. And that's the idea with a uh, diversification. Now, this is a very, very uh, unique and um, uh, simple example. And if you actually do the research, and one thing that you'll uh, start to understand is that ideally, you want about 20, they usually say 25 to 30 stocks uh, that will help eliminate any um, unsystematic uh, risk, okay? And that, again, is the idea, is to minimize um, unsystematic risk. Now, I realize we haven't actually discussed the difference between systematic and unsystematic risk, so let's go ahead and do that. But really, this is a very common investment strategy. You're not putting all your eggs in one basket, and the idea is you're really spreading out your wealth so you can minimize risk, okay? But one thing you will notice just by looking at this chart is that we can see that systematic risk, and also that says right here, you cannot eliminate, okay? So we're reducing our risk to the point where we're only um, exposed to systematic risk. But the idea of diversification, it removes the unsystematic risk. So yeah, what is unsystematic and what is systematic? So let's take a look. <clears throat> 
okay? So when we're dealing with risk, we have both unsystematic risk, okay? And this is what we mean by diversible risk, okay? So we can actually diversify this type of risk, okay? But then we have systematic risk, which is really something that we can't really control. It's kind of out of our hands, okay? So when we're, when we're looking at unsystematic risk, <clears throat> And why do, we, why do we call it diversible risk? Well, these are uh, risks that are really specific to the company or even sometimes the industry, okay? So again, if, imagine if you're investing in, um, in stocks, for instance, let's say hotel stocks and there's a labor strike or something like that. Um, this is an example of unsystematic risk. So you need to think about different companies that you can invest in or different um, opportunities where you don't, that, that labor strike won't affect um, your other assets, okay? So this is what we mean by unsystematic. And if you balance out your uh, portfolio, you don't have to be um, impacted by these types of risk. Now, however, in the, in the, the opposite uh, is true with systematic risk, which is really not really avoidable, okay? And this is more bigger spectrum. Uh, you know, if there's a recession, for instance, if inflation occurs, uh, you know, going back to interest rates, all those things are things that really we can't control. The market uh, is it's out of our hands, and there's always going to be some risk associated. Now, think back to those risk-free rates. Okay, we always have to deal with inflation. Um, another great example, unfortunately, was COVID. Okay, so this was an idea of systematic risk, something completely out of your control, um, and sometimes, and obviously, sometimes uh, very hard to predict. Okay, so this is what we mean by unsystematic risk. Okay, but the idea is we're trying to have that diversified portfolio <clears throat> where we can reduce or hopefully even eliminate unsystematic risk. So how do we do that? Well, um, you know, mutual funds, basically the idea of investing in lots of different um, stocks. More modern is an ETF, okay, personal favorite of mine, um, where we're looking at um, <clears throat> electronically traded funds. But again, the same idea is think about some sort of index fund where you're actually uh, not just focusing on one company or one industry, but you're actually looking at investing in multiple different types of companies and industries. And ideally, you want to make sure that they're not or they're negatively uh, correlated so that we can reduce that risk. All right, wonderful. So we've gone through our objectives. Just one more round. Thanks for watching and happy financing.